question. <coughs> so, one of my things, I, why I was, oh yeah, actually, why I wanted to turn it back on you two, which I thought was, I mean, especially you, was this kind of, <laughs> idea, was this idea of having one's individuality expressed through one's bodily technique if it's being taught. And although there is a dislocation of meaning through the, without the use of words and without the use of, kind of direct instruction, we still see an authority being stamped onto an individual. And where, as we kind of see, I've, if you've any of you read Sabah Mahmoud and Hershkin, we have this, again, this kind of like, the party movement being expressed as something which makes people reflect on themselves in this kind of very ethical way. However, she, the, and part of my criticism to come is, they remove all discussions of class politics. This is, as I argue, as I do argue, a bourgeois habitus being developed. I, I think we could, because the three of us can actually discuss that later. I think it's sort of perhaps so I won't, uh, we won't get a chance to uh, speak or listen to most of yeah. your thoughts. So maybe. Take questions. Okay. If we've got time, and we can elaborate on that. Yeah. Good yeah. Point. Um, Charles, you first. Um, my question is to join us. Um, you, I find it really interesting how you sort of thought of theatre scapes and how the like it's sort of a cultural landscape, theatre scapes, and you sort of use all these sort of spatial metaphors. You even uh, you reference Deleuze talking about re-territorialisation. It's an actual space you've been occupying. Whereas I would have thought of theatre as a sort of process and uh, you know a performance. Um, why do you think it's helpful to sort of conceptualise these things as landscape and sort of spatial? In fact, this is something I should have perhaps, oh, I, I, I did actually think I mentioned it. It's, it's, it's quite important that they actually came up with this term. Um, so theatre landscape amongst, um, I mean, this is a, I, I elaborate on, on two other terms in, in, in the dissertation I'm writing. But for them, the term radical subjectivity, the ensemble, and in fact theatre landscapes, they're sort of metaphors along which they, um, as you quite, I mean, this, is, this fits really interestingly with your presentation, they quite literally use it not only as something they write about um, and they publish and they sort of you know bring to they uh, they sort of introduce the audience to, but they quite literally build their very the villa the very villa the very house that they perform in, so that it could accommodate this notion of travel. So on the one hand, of, of, on the one side of the theatre, which is sort of I, I worked a lot with the with the workshops, which in fact are in the actual theatre, they produce every stage design so that it can be moved from the stage, which is on one side of the building through past all the, the carpenter and the welding stuff, and there used to be the photographer as well, who was employed by the theatre, straight through to the trucks, which they then used to travel, you know, whatever, to Madrid or Italy or somewhere in Germany. Um, and so uh, uh, in that sense, I, you know, I actually listened to them, and, and they said, listen, this is really, we are, it's not just an idea, it's, it's not just a practice, but it actually informs the architecture of the place. Um, and in, in, in that sense, Deleuze and the re of places is, you know, is, is, is something one can actually drop. And I think one should, perhaps, I should have, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to actually return to the people that tell you something rather than to, you know, old French philosophers. But um, it was quite, it was literally there. The space was literally uh, created to accommodate this flexibility. Yeah, yeah I thought they were all brilliant presentations. I've just got a quick question for each of you. Um, start with three of them. I'm really feeling the way you're bringing the Max Labour ideal types back into the picture. Um, I mean, my question would be sure, we can contrast the kind of authority the state might hold and the, the different uh, the different leaders of these different uh, Muridi brotherhoods might, might hold. They might have a more charismatic or routinized charismatic authority. <coughs> but to what degree is that posing an actual? challenge of sovereignty, an actual undermining of the authority of the state, or to what degree is it, insofar as it's in a different field, not much of a political challenge at all? Shall I do that one first, or should we just do that? Which one was it? Just, 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 just ask them all three. Yeah, all three. Yeah, yeah, all three. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. And for for, for Rag, Rag, Ragnild. Ragnild. Um, also really interesting, I just wanted to ask, because you were talking about we can't understand <laughs> We shouldn't sort of look at the, the embodiment and the aesthetic group in a sort of Borgesian perspective. It's not just the embodiment of power and habitus, um, but it does involve sort of reflection and asking of the question why. Um, and I guess to that to Google, do we say it's conscious? I mean, I just wanted to, I just wondered to what, all right, maybe in this context, 
we have to see it as a more conscious form of reflection. But to what degree does that undermine Borges' uh, model more generally? I mean, in sort of, Borges is sort of accusing most people of being unconscious and embodying things all the time rather than reflecting on it. While in the space of the theatre that might, that might happen, does that not suggest, insofar as the theatre is sort of a bit of a, a bit of a holy space apart from society in general, maybe the rest of the time we are being a bit kind of trapped in the universal doctor at the moment? And then Jonas, I just thought I wondered if you could explain a bit more about the relationship between the immigrant experience of a lot of the people involved in your, in your field and the particular ideas that you presented. Okay, so quickly, um, I my uh, my dissertation topic is on the Muslim Brotherhood. My, why I look at the Muslim Brotherhood, I really see lots of. Uh, although the Muslim Brotherhood is completely anti-Sufi because of its mysticality, the second example I gave you, Sheikh Ghaibullah, who wasn't actually present this thing at, at his zikr, does exactly quite the same thing. <laughs> So the, the strengths of the Muslim Brotherhood, and particularly why I see they're going to succeed in the wake of, in the vacuum created by Mubarak's um, expulsion, is the fact that they offer an alternative structure to the, to the form of state that's failed the people. One of the, biggest, one of the biggest failures is the failure on the part of the state to provide in the social contract. So in terms of acqui seeking acquiescence for the state, they will offer all the services they can to the people, all the services they can. As they failed that, the Muslim Brotherhood has been seeking lots more. F they've been pro providing free health care and things. And Sheikh Gaibullah does exactly the same thing. Has funded more, has funded three health, uh, free, three free hospitals, and also offers this kind of counselling service with very direct control which then they will lend money on short term basis and seek out networks so that people can get so people can get involved in employment issues and blah blah blah. So what I'm except what I'm saying is you challenge the legitimacy of the state when you offer an alternative to that with an ideology not not of opposition radical opposition to the state, but one that's almost in line but, but different, and that difference comes in the spiritualization of the religi religious side of that. So while they are very much not political bodies, they are extremely political bodies because they can impact you, the individual, directly. Their governmentality is stronger than you would ever see in any state, even China. That, that's what I'm saying. That leads quite nicely into what I was going to reply with, actually. In a way, I I see your point, and I also very well. My, like I completely understand the sort of like it. There is a very like I'm not saying that there's not a very powerful structure in the studio. There is a very powerful structure in these theatre practices as, as well. Like you know, learning to listen and what it means to listen isn't. I mean, it is something that you really have to learn and embody to be part of it. And then if you if you disagree. You can leave, and that is sort of a free thing that is like middle class bourgeoisie in the sense that you're free to leave, you're free to go. What I'm trying to highlight is how, even though there is this very sort of compelling nature of, of embodying things, I don't know if you looked at Vanier's work, um, which is also taking like phenomenology and uh, and uh, Schiller's work on body schema into the picture, and how you're sort of constructing an entire image of yourself that then affects how you act in the world. Um, but that still doesn't, that explains to you a lot about the sort of power discourse at work, but it tells you very little about the sort of, the, the notion of a meaningful practice that is really like crucial for how the self is constructed, at least in the Western, like in this sort of, you know, late modern neoliberal capitalism, whatever we're moving in right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, where there is a sort of sense of you're searching for meaning and the power of discourses shows very little. It doesn't explain, it doesn't give you a framework within which you can explain the search for meaning. Um, and therefore I find it sort of, it's useful up to a certain point, but it's not enough. You need to go beyond it and question the frameworks further, which also would maybe give a different look to how, I mean, who are the people who started this alternative thing and why did they do it? And sort of 
to not just look at the power structures, but to look at the actual people. And that leads nicely to mine because it leads badly to mine. To some extent, because um, I'll, I'll answer your question actually with a comment to yours as well. Because the idea not only of, of sort of some sort of almost elitist uh, um, you know group that in the, in case of the Sikhs that you need to you know that you whether they're a particular uh, I'm not going to get you wrong. Okay, okay. Uh, a close close community at least where there are certain power structures, or in your case uh, a community into which you need you know into in in which you learn how to become an actor. That in fact is. Truly and Schaeffer and Edzard Haben, who lead the theatre, they really try to deconstruct exact, exactly that idea. For them, that is the exact problem of society is that it does distinguish and that it does spatialize amongst people. The Theatre Landscape Project is one that seeks to, that seeks to cut cr uh, across these boundaries. And the idea is that you don't <coughs> need to learn how to become an actor. Their, their troupe was deliberately set up, in fact, I mean, by an emigre, you know, who came, who came to. As a, as a doctor, but who then began working as a lorry driver. Ferhat Keskin, uh, who's someone that I, that I kept mentioning, he's, he, he spent time in prison because he, 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 I mean, because he, he, he danced at a Kurdish prison, uh, at a Kurdish uh, protest somewhere, and he, 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 was a, he was a construction site worker. And a lot of the people that I interviewed, they said, you know, if, if it wasn't for theater, I'd be an alcoholic, I'd be somewhere in the street. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that they don't also have professional actors, you know, they're, they're quite a recognized theater in Germany. But so the point there to respond to yours is the, the very idea that a theater opens up space which opens up a space which is, not, which is not supposed to structure human beings but to enable exactly that cooperation between them without homogenizing them. And so I mean it's, it's an extremely intellectualist uh, sort of sphere where not only do the programs but also the introductions and, and everything you're sort of being thrown at the book stand etc which is all part of it. They seek exactly to play on that bit which in fact Bourdieu elaborates on. He says it is the habitus which is effectively class for him that does determine our, 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 our body and our being and our speech. But there's also that subject virtuos virtuosity, it's sort of like Michael Lambeck speaks about, which however is constrained by it. Right? And so the, the Ta'ata and Award tries to sort of, you know, not search for truth, but in fact to confuse people. That truly keeps saying he, he's, he sees himself like a shaman who who, who, you know, who tries to come up with weird things that people don't quite understand. So they, just as Ferhat Keskin, when he uses a, sort of a, 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 a language he comes up with on stage, um, that gives people the idea of uh, a sense of trying to understand others and others' difference, rather than, you know, rather than bringing them together and, and, and making them homogenous. Okay, one more question from Adam, and then um, we'll have to end yeah, well, Bertolt Brecht, in fact, is, is you know, the starting point, I guess, for everybody who, uh, who's interested in theatre, in particular in, in sort of reflexive political theatre, because, you know, his tradition, his anti-Aristotelian tradition is very much the starting point, not only for people who study theatre, but, in fact, for a lot of theatre companies. And so whilst I was writing my proposal, in fact, I, you know, I brought it Brecht in every way because his idea of the Verfremdungseffekt is really exactly about confusing people so that they cry when in fact they should be laughing, etc. People walk around in the audience smoking their cigars or doing other stuff that actually gives you the sense of this is not just theatre which provides you with meaning, which finds out a truth, but it's one in fact which questions the very notion of truth. When, however, I, I, you know, I, I sat in a room with, with Schäfer and Trulli and we, sort of, you know, we talk about some random stuff and I say, well, um, I was going to write about Brecht and Foucault and Deleuze. Uh, they said, "Please don't. You know, like, like we don't, we don't want to be reduced to Brecht. We don't want to be reduced to Foucault, and we we don't know Deleuze." Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I still went down. Yeah, I still went down the path, and now I actually think that you know, it's Brecht is an interesting starting point, but a lot of the stuff that he himself, he was quite an authoritative figure himself, and it's interesting that, I mean, they, the, th the Three Penny Opera and a couple of their plays are integrated fundamentally into the Teatro Novo because they really are just important reference points. But you cannot stage a Brecht play without admission of the Brecht Foundation. If you, you need to stick to particular ways of performing it, which is defeating the point. You know, it's, it's uh, so that's why they, you know, Within the discourse of theatre and within this, the, within theatre directors' talk and writing about theatre, they they they've moved beyond Brecht, but he's certainly a really important uh, reference point.
happen. Mm. I think like maybe perhaps in your theatre yeah. world, whereas in um, yeah. Polish theatre there is an emergence more of like Grotowski and as and this mm. like secular sacrum almost like mm. it very directly actually comes from a reaction against Catholicism and the search for a mm. a secular sacrum, something yeah. sacred, non religious in the theatre. And, um, and that's the interesting thing about theatre is actually that you made that point, Isaac, that it's not actually just in a textualized ex extra quotidian sphere. You know, it's exactly embedded in really particular contexts, which is why it's so interesting. You know, mm. because it it necessarily arises from them and responds to them. You know, it's 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 call and response, as as um, uh, Cohen Cruz. You know, uh, that's the title of an interesting book which deals about, uh, with that. Mm. But I guess we'll move the questions out. Yeah, thank you guys, that was really very good. Um...